Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Take your Bibles, open them to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38, I've entitled our Bible study, Grace, Grace, a Friend of Sinners. Uh, If you read ahead, you know that chapter 38 is a very difficult chapter. And I encourage you, one of the advantages of studying through the Bible verse by verse is you can read ahead. Because our next Bible study will be where we left off. And we've been pretty good at being able to cover at least a chapter every Wednesday And one of the things we learn in difficult chapters like this is that the Bible never glances over or overlooks the failures of its heroes. You get the full understanding of their life. You see the good and the bad. As God chronicles the lives of those that he uses, he always includes it all. The good, the bad, and yes, the ugly. He doesn't just make mention of the difficulties in the people that he uses. He doesn't just put a little footnote of their lives, but rather he shines the bright spotlight of his holiness on, you could say even for you, on our unholiness. Men like Adam and Lot and Abraham, women like Eve, Rahab, Isaac, Jacob, you name them. Their lives are an open book before us. If you want to feel the full weight of this truth, then just consider if your life story was put in the Bible. No, not necessarily the way you tell it, but the way it is. And you would go, I don't want anybody reading my story for all of eternity, learning from my mistakes. And it's true. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want it. Even the, the antiseptic way that you describe or, or the fact that as you share your testimony, you leap purposely leap points out because they're so painful to you. The Bible's not like that. The Bible gives it to you all. I believe the reality of the Bible containing these sordid stories of its heroes, both all of their defects, all of their disappointments, adds to its credibility. It's an answer to the critics. And here's why. If you and I were asked to write an autobiography of our own lives, we would probably do the exact opposite of what God has done. We would gloss over or minimize our mistakes while highlighting and emphasizing the mistakes of the people we don't like too much. Or we may say, I was bad, but compared to so-and-so, I was a saint. And that's just how we are. We may mention our mistakes, maybe even footnote them, but most of the book that we wrote would express the good things about our lives and emphasize those things that we see God has done rather than dwell on the difficulties. You can see that the men that God inspired to write the Bible, they wrote the truth. Even someone like Saul of Tarsus or Paul the Apostle, when he highlights the difficulties of his life, he gives it to us straight and deep. And you're looking at Paul's life, you're like, man, he was bad. And yet look what God can do. Chapter 38 ranks up in one of the the worst chapters in all the Bible, dark and dreary, you could say. After reading it, you'll wonder, you're, you may have wondered, why is it even there? Uh, we meet people like Judah, Tamar, Perez, Zerah. And if you're a Bible student, you read through the genealogy given to us in Matthew's gospel, these names sound familiar. I mean, these are people in the genealogy of Messiah. Judah himself is an important man in the Bible. It's from the line of Judah. Jesus is the from the tribe of the lion of Judah. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. I said that backwards, but you can always fix it later in your head. In Revelation chapter five, verse four, so I wept much, the Bible says, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. We would think somebody so closely attached 
to the genealogy of Jesus, Judah, would have a stellar life and a perfect life. And if we went through and did a background check on Judah, we would come, he would come up clean with a clean slate. But in chapter 38, you see he's not the clean slate. He doesn't live the clean slate life that you would expect. Jesus, he's known as a friend of sinners. That's the grace of God, friends. As a matter of fact, if Jesus wasn't a friend of sinners, how would you have ever been reached? How would you have been ever to relate to Messiah? As sinners, we're in need of his wonderful forgiveness and cleansing grace. That's the biggest barrier. The inability to admit our own failures. That's why our autobiography would look like, man, look at what a stellar person he is or she is. That's why people refuse. The Bible says in Romans chapter one that there is a suppression of the truth in unrighteousness. That's how attractive sin is. Not only do we not want to admit it, but we want to hide it and push it down. It requires a great humility to admit the reality of who we are. I believe this chapter is included not only to reveal the reality of the people God uses and the deep grace that God shows, but there's also a practical use of this chapter for the rest of the book of Genesis. And that is there's a contrast and a separation taking place. Remember, we're in the last section of Genesis where the focus is on the last of the four people that it highlights, Joseph. There's a separation of Joseph from the life of his brothers. We already know he's going to be separated and he, because he's sold and he's already in that place of being sold and separated. But now we have this little parent parentheses to show how wicked and corrupt his brothers really are. And we already know about their depravity. If you're a Bible student, you keep following along. We already know how bad they are. They had the Shechem incident, the massacre there. Incest has taken place plotting, lying, hypocrisies. But more so in chapter 38, we see that the children of Jacob are becoming a lot like the world in which they live. They're not living a separated life. They're, they're not living in a way to honor the God of their father. And they're going to pay for this. We learn that Leah's oldest sons were very bad men. In chapter 34, Simeon and Levi, they're the ones that massacred the Shechemites. In chapter 35, Reuben, remember, defiles his dad's bed. And now chapter 38, we have Judah in deep in sexual sin. This chapter alone covers about 20 years of history. And that's where you get a good Bible handbook like Haley's Bible handbook or a good Bible dictionary so that when you're reading through the Bible, even though you're, taking, you're turning a page, things change so quickly. What's happening here? Well, time has passed. This whole chapter covers a lot of time. And I know when you're listening to Bible studies, well, how could I ever learn that? Get a good Bible handbook. Haley's Bible handbook is the best little introductory Bible handbook that you should have in your library and I'm not sure if he picks up on this. Um, I, I got it from a commentary. I'm not sure how he picked up on it, but it is, it, you pick up on other things and you begin to learn the different nuances of the scriptures, even though it goes from chapter to chapter. So with that in mind, let's pick up in verse one of chapter 38. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He married her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son and called his name Onan. She conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was at Chezeb when she bore him. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. This city of Adullam was about 15 miles northeast of Hebron. He arrives in the town, sees an attractive Canaanite woman, and marries her. They have three kids, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Judah married off Ur to Tamar, 
And we see these first few verses cover quite a few years. That, that's one of the pieces you can pick up when you're reading that th- the description here of children being born and marriages taking place, a lot of time has passed just in the beginning stages when you're reading in context. And here we have these years that are described here are not honoring to God. Judah in these years of his lives are not, is not living a life honoring God. Right away, you see the spiritual condition of Judah, which, by the, name, by the way, his name means praise, but he's not living up to his name at this point. He's in a Canaanite land, and he has taken a Canaanite wife with no regard to his heritage or his upbringing or even God's desire to bless his family. And you might wonder sometimes, even before we get into the depth of this chapter, You may wonder sometimes, or you may even tire of it, but you may wonder why as a pastor, at least in this church, I continually emphasize the simplicity of nurturing your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Sometimes it would be said, read your Bible every day. Pray every day. Obey what the word of God says. Be an Acts 2.42 Christian. Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Share the gospel with your friends and family. Pray for them. It it may come out in Jesus' exhortation. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. It's on repeat constantly, continually, continually. If you're not careful, depending on what your background is or where you come from, you know, you may go, well, that's just religion. That's just what pastors do. That's just, that, that's just a religious way to live. You know, I'm going to do things my own way. I'm going to go my own path. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you the reason why I emphasize it, because if you stray from the simple things, your life will become a mess. It'll become far worse. You go, wait a minute, I'm reading the Bible and praying every day. My life is already a mess. Not as bad as it could be because you're tethered to the Lord and you're holding fast to his promises and you're seeking his help. And even though life might be a mess, it's a mess in the context of your relationship with the Lord. If you weren't, You know, you're out doing your own thing and you're blown off the Bible. I mean, simple things. You know, sometimes people go, I don't read the Bible. I don't want to read the Bible. It's too hard to understand. Okay, I'll grant that to you. Some things in the Bible are very hard to understand. Here's my advice to you. Set those aside and pay attention to the ones you do understand. Don't steal. Oh, I just don't understand what that means. (laughs) What do you mean you don't understand what that means? Don't lie. I don't know. What's lying? I don't know what lying is. Like, Pay attention to the things that you do understand. Skip, it's okay. You have permission. Here's a pastor telling you. You have permission to skip over the things that are hard for you to understand. Just write a little note. Get back to that. Get back to that. Maybe 50 years you might understand it, but I'll get back to that. But you read it anyway. Just don't, don't read so that you understand every single word. Read the Bible to get to know the author. If you're open to receive from God and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit will teach you things, even things you can't understand. If you're not a believer today, go, well, I don't care about God. I don't care about the Bible. Here's why you should read the Bible. And by the way, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ today, here's where you go to the Bible. Get a Bible. Even if you come here, if you email us or send us, we'll get you a Bible. But you can also download one on your phone. Uh, if you look in your app store, U version, Y-O-U version, free app, every version you can think of of the Bible, Open up your Bible to the Gospel of John. And if you need help, call the church here, 303-628-7200. And whoever answers the phone can help you find the Gospel of John. You don't have to be embarrassed about it. We'll help you find it. We'll help you open it and just start reading about the life of Jesus Christ. That's why you should read the Bible, to learn about God's love for you. So that you can learn that God, he loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. That's how much he cares for you. I mean, you have to think about it in this case, how much you care for someone, just someone, and what you would do for that person you care for, what, what you, how you would go out of your way for them, how you would give them money if they needed it or a place to stay. It's in you. 
The care for someone in a self-sacrificial way is in every human being. Why? Because you were created in the image of God. Even if you don't live for God today, you were, care, you were created in God's image. You, you, care, you carry some of those attributes of God. And as you carry them in that, and you say, yeah, I've cared for someone before. I've helped someone before. I've, I've given, I've sacrificed for someone before. I want you to think about that for a moment and what you have done and consider how much God, your father in heaven loves you. It's possible for someone to love such a way. I mean, you have even done it. And here you are imperfect. Here you are just in a place where, man, I can't do much, but I'll do what I can. Well, God, he went all the way. He has made every way possible for you to be in a right relationship with him because he loves you. Just as you've expressed, maybe you don't call it love. Maybe you've done it because you care for someone. Maybe you've done it because you like someone. Maybe you've done it because it's the right thing to do or just the honorable the thing to do or the moral thing to do. Well, God's done it because he loves you completely. And even today, you can turn away from your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for you personally to become a part of the family of God. As a pastor, I beg you not because it's the pastor thing to do, but I know by experience and by ministering for many, many years in the body of Christ, if you stray away from the basics, your devotional life, your prayer life, your Bible reading, your fellowship of remembering the Lord's body and his broken body, his shed blood for you, when you stray away from these things, unspiritual, ungodly, and unbiblical decisions will flow from your life. Your life will no longer honor God. You can't get away with it. It will have an effect in your life. It's only a matter of time before we fall flat on our faces. You see here Judah, he's in the world. He's living for the world. He's marrying the world. He's creating children of the world. And you'll see the rest of the chapter. It doesn't get much better for him. Notice verse seven. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord killed him. And Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir for your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he emitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. And then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, lest he also dies as brothers did. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. This is a sobering passage and one of great debate. To see God exact such severe punishment on Ur and Onan has troubled people through the ages. It's here that sometimes folks will come as a critic of the Bible and say, look, man, what is up with God? There's such a different God in the Old Testament than there is in the New Testament. And he's so severe. I mean, when you step back for a second and understand the judgment of God, I just want you to understand there's a couple of things you need to know. Number one, God is the author of life. He owns life and therefore he can take it. Life belongs to him. It originated from him. But secondly, when you see the fact that God doesn't do this all the time, you have to remember the grace. <laughs> Why are you alive today? Are you so much better? Oh yeah, pastor. Well, you're, you're, even if you're so much better, the reason you're alive today is by the grace of God. The breath you have in your lungs, I, like I'm alive by the grace of God. And I'm able to live an abundant life by a double portion of the grace of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Who am I to deserve anything different than these guys? Well, you know, you're not a Canaanite. Well, but I was totally anti-God my whole life. You don't have to be a Canaanite to, be, to hate God. I mean, who are we? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It, it is severe and it is sudden, but is he the God of the Old Testament different than the God of the New Testament? Say it out loud, church. Pop quiz. No. And I'll prove it to you as you guys studied with us not too long ago in the book of Acts. We have an episode in the early church where a husband and a wife were so inspired 
to sell their property and bring the proceeds to the church so everybody could see that they're just as generous as Barnabas was. Remember their names? Ananias and Sapphira. They conspired together to lie to God. And what did God do? He took their lives. Suddenly. It's God's sovereign prerogative to do such. Which would make us very grateful for our lives. To live our lives to honor God. To remember who we are and where we came from. I mean, imagine what the church would look like today if God continued to do regularly what he did with Ananias and Sapphira. Bam, 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 bam. This place would be empty. Nobody would want to come. It's like, where's the pastor? Oh, that was last week, man. He was out. He's a goner, man. <laughs> and nobody wants to be the pastor. Nobody, there's, it's gone. But God is gracious. He's so good to us and gracious. And our lives, they belong to him. Belong to him. We don't know what Ur did exactly. There's been debate on this. We can see that he didn't carry through what was necessary for conception to take place. We see that. But that's not really the issue. It's not the issue. The issue is, is that, notice, you come back in verse 7. He's wicked in the sight of the Lord. The Lord killed him. Then you come back with Onan, his brother. Go into your brother's wife. Raise up an heir for your brother. It was the custom of the day, by the way. It's called leveret marriage. And what that means is that's the marriage of a man to his deceased brother's wife. And we praise God that that's not required today. And as you see, when a man, well, that, when a man died, his brother was to marry his widow. But Onan refuses. And then in verse 9, he knew that the heir would not be his. It came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he wanted the pleasure of intimacy, but not the responsibility. And what he did, verse 10, displeased the Lord, and therefore he killed him also. Many people have interpreted this in many ways and quite frankly have taken liberties beyond the clear reading of the text. Some have described this as God judging artificial birth control. Others refer to a specific sexual sin like masturbation. Um, a lot of different things. But clearly the Bible doesn't say either. It doesn't declare what it is. It was an act of rebellion against God. And how careful we need to be to take something that the Bible says and try to read into it some cultural phenomena. The clear reading of the text is he's rebelling against God, he's displeasing to the Lord, and it cost him his life. So with his last son, Judah is very careful, cautious, and puts up an excuse to protect him as so far he's lost two sons uh, over this. Now, notice in verse 12. In the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died, and Judah was comforted, and went up to his sheep shearers in Temnah, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, look, your father-in-law is going up to Temnah to shear his sheep. Now remember, the last time we met, uh, the last time we heard about Tamar was at the end of verse 11, where she, was, she went and dwelt in her father's house as a widow, and she's just sort of forgotten there. Now we read of her again, we, we hear of Judah heading up to the area of Tenna, and she hears about it. Uh, and she, it says she saw that Sheila was grown and she was not given to him as a wife. Again, sort of forgotten. And when Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. And then he turned to her by the way and said, please let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, what will you give me that you may come into me? And he said, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, will you give me a pledge until you send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give you? So she said, your signet and your cord and your staff that's in your hand. And he gave them to her and went into her. And she conceived by him. Time has passed. 
Tamar sort of realizes she's not going to marry Sheila. She's in a place of being neglected and overlooked. And if feelings come and arise, could be feelings of bitterness, could be some manipulation going on here. We, we know that there is some evil in, uh, involved here because of what happens between Judah and her and how she sets him up. So she decides to go to Timnah to entice Judah and dresses up in harlot's clothing. Now, let me ask a question here just for a second. How did she know that she would get his attention? How did she know that this scheme would work? She lived with him. I don't want you to miss that. She lived with him for many years. And I know we all have reputations in the church and we're all known as something in the church and we all have our relationships in the church, but the real you, people at home know that. And my hope of course is, is that for us, there is no difference between the real us and what we bring into the company of believers. But I mean, let's not be naive. There's a lot of hypocrisy in the church. It's one of the reasons why people are put off by the church because they've met a hypocrite or two. Or even in our lives, maybe we don't live the life of a hypocrite, but there are seasons in our life where we live hypocritically. It's something as we were praying today in our prayer request that we really need to take to heart in Psalm 139 to have the Lord search us and know us and reveal in us if there's any unclean thing and not play the hypocrite. But here, she lived with the man. She knew him. She knew all about him. And I would answer that his reputation and the depth of his character preceded him. She knew of his sinful ways. Why? How, Ed? She lived with him. And know that the men and women and the boys and girls that live with you know you. Don't you be deceived. You're not getting away with anything. They know you. And that's not to say that we're going to have a perfect life in our homes or we're going to always make the right decisions, but they know you. Now, I know this is an exaggerated example, but man, you don't want to be known as someone that would be tempted by harlots. <laughs> that have a relationship with harlots, that are mean-spirited or whatever the sin might be. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse one, it says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. I believe for a few listening today, you. You need to hear this because so much time is spent building a career, climbing the corporate ladder, building that nest egg, buying that new thing, jumping from this to that, but so little time is spent building a strong character, doing the deep work of the inward woman, of the inward man, the sacrificial work, investing your life in a reputation that brings honor and glory to your name, not just to the people that see you for an hour at church, but to the people who live with you and the people that work with you so that your rep reputation does precede you as a woman of God, as a man of God, as an honest person, a person of character. I mean, this is something I have to take to heart continually as I teach you. I don't come into the pulpit with clean hands, but I believe I come into the pulpit with integrity and with a deep character that God continues to build in my life. I don't come into the pulpit with deceptively trying to make you think that I walk on water <laughs> and I'm just so perfect, guys. One day you'll be like me. You don't want to be like me. You follow me as I follow Christ. I want to be the kind of example that you can look up to, that your kids will respect, yes. And anytime I forget that, I want you to remember this. I teach Bible studies where my kids and my wife sit in the chairs and receive the word of God from me. I need to stand in the pulpit in such a way where not only do they know me, but my life is lived in such a way that they'll receive the word of God from me. 
or it'll be a double whammy or a triple whammy where they're just like turning me off. He's such a hypocrite. He's such a liar. Like I would never listen to that guy. I can't believe you guys listen to that guy. And as soon, I, I always knew when we started the fellowship, we started with five people and I always knew I'd be in trouble if the church ever shrank to below five. If Marie started going to another church <laughs> or they, you know, the kids didn't want to come or stay home. Like, so you got to do the deep work. You got to live lives that are honest and forthright. You, you got to be apologetic and, and, and not even like learn from your mistakes. So you don't have to be constantly apologetic and just say, hey, this is the way it is. Would you forgive me? And let's move forward and live lives of integrity. So that if someone is living with you, even for a season, they're like, man, that, that, that lady, she's a, she's a godly woman. Well, how do you know that? I lived with her, man. I watched her. I listened to her prayers. I could hear her pray from the other. She wasn't cussing people out on the phone. She was praying. She wasn't ripping people off in her business. She was helping, giving extra, promising little, delivering more. She was in the word. When we needed, when we were struggling, she said, let's, let's come to the table and let's pray. And let the Lord do the deep work. It was Charles Spurgeon that wrote, and I quote, a good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you, those who were helped by you will remember you when forget-me-nots are withered. And I love this. Carve your name on hearts and not on marble. Just pour into people's lives and live a life that's upright. Don't ever confuse an upright life with a perfect life. None of us will land that. But I'm telling you, if you walk in integrity, God will honor that. And people will see it, especially in a culture we live in right now that's just so plastic and fake. And it's not just the world, you know. The church is like that too. Just so plastic and fake and a, a bunch of celebrity pastors, which doesn't even exist. You know, that's not even true. That doesn't even exist. There is no such thing as a celebrity pastor. You're a celebrity pastor right now listening in. You better choose one. And if you choose celebrity, get out of the pulpit. And if you choose pastor, then shepherd the flock of God that's among you. And carve your name and carve your name on hearts and not on marble. That's so good. Oh, well, I guess some people are happy with that, but that's... <laughs> Judah had a reputation and it wasn't his name. It wasn't praise. And she sets him up and gets pregnant. <laughs> it's like Judah should have known better. He could have turned his eyes, looked the other way, doesn't see it as a trap. But that's where he was, walking in the flesh, in the world, of the world, for the world. That's his life. Let me hire you. What will you give me? I'll give you a goat. <laughs> it's like, it's just so silly. But you know, we're laughing at it as I intended. I wanted to get a little bit of chuckle at that, but I'll tell you, I've seen men give women less than a goat for a night of illicit sex. I've seen men give up less for some stupid pictures of pornography and not get anything in return and ruin their lives and ruin their marriages and become completely captivated and in bondage to fake sexual sin. It's not even real. It's fake. So we look at it in the Old Testament and you're like, man, the sins of thousands of years ago are still with us today. It's just a different delivery mechanism. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 26, would you turn there with me? I want you to see it uh, before we head out. A few more verses, but let's cross-reference this so you just see it. You know, the Bible, it's its, own, it's its own commentary. And you're looking for examples in the Bible. The best illustrations of the Bible are from the Bible. And this is a great one. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26. It was just, what, 13 days. A couple weeks ago, if you're reading through the Proverbs every day, on the 6th of the month, you were reading this proverb. And here it says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 26. For by means of a harlot... A man is reduced to a crust of bread and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Let me say that again, but you answer it, church. It's a question. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can he walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he 
who goes to his neighbor's wife, whoever touches her shall not be innocent. And the same could be said for the women who choose this as well. And what does he do? He leaves a signet ring, his cord, and his staff as collateral. The signet king was an identifiable mark of who Judah was. The staff showed that he was a shepherd with authority. The signet showed he had kingly authority. It was almost as if he left his wallet and his ID and his phone with the code with her to be identified exactly. Judah left, let a few moments of pleasure strip him of the rest of his dignity. And it happens all the time. Before it, you think it wouldn't happen to you, just remember, you can jot it down in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Just know, be careful. Read it for homework. Understand that the significance, let me just read it to you. You can jot it down, but I think it's good to hear it. Just for those that might be plotting sin right now, might be planning how to get away with something, might be thinking you're get away, you are getting away with it. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, it says uh, in verse 12, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common a man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will always make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. There's always a way of escape. But before that in verse 11, I went right to 12, but verse 11 says this. Now all these things happen to them as examples. You're reading about Judah? It happened as an example. Learn from Judah today. They were written for our admonition or our instruction on whom the ends of the age have come. Judah tries to pay her off. Notice in verse 19, she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood to which he would recognize, which leads to the question, why, how, he, how could he not recognize her? Even though she had the clothes of a harlot on, how could she not, he, he not recognize her? which leads to credibility to the theory that she lived in a distant part of the home of the, of the compound and was literally forgotten and left alone and neglected and overlooked. Or he was just dumb. Or who knows? Who knows what it was? But now she changes clothes and Judah sent the goat by the hand of his friend to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he couldn't find her. Verse 21. Then he asked the men of that place, hey, where's the harlot that is open by the roadside? And they said, there's no harlot around here, bro. Who are you talking about? And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also, the men of the place said, there's no harlot in this place. And Judah said, let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. For I sent this young goat and you have not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Now, we learn this when our study with David's life, remember, that David was so overcome with guilt and shame about his own sin that when God sent his friend Nathan with a little story asking David, what would you do in the situation? He pronounced the death penalty on the story when it wouldn't, didn't require the death penalty. And here Judah is so self-righteous. He is so far from God. Remember, remember this about Judah in this chapter. He's in the world, of the world, for the world. We have a threefold enemy, don't we? The world, the flesh, and the devil. And here he's living it in. It all started when he departed from his brothers and visited a Dulamite and saw the Canaanite in the world, of the world, for the world. You take one step. I've been th rethinking, there's this illustration that we've used over the years uh, that we've described people in the church. You have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And I've just been rethinking that. And I just don't think that's possible. I've come to the conclusion, I don't think that's possible. If your foot is in the world, you're in the world. Don't fool yourself. You're in the world, you're of the world, 
and it's only a short amount. Hey, I'm glad that the other foot's in the church, but it really doesn't matter to you because you're in the world. You don't really care. You're living for the world. You're living like the world. You're living for this world. And you're going to find out that it's going to come back to bite you because the only thing that's in this world, we were told in 1 John, John told us, if you love the world, you don't have the love of the Father in you. (laughs) That's pretty powerful. I think over the years, we've talked about one foot in the world, one foot in the church, and I get it. I probably will use that illustration to bring a point home, but I just don't think it's possible. If your foot is in the world, it's almost like if you, it's, we kind of do it like this, where you got your feet out and you're just going to fall. I think if your foot is in the world and in the church, your foot is like this and your very next step is going to be completely in the world. You're not going to straddle the fence. If your wor- foot is in the world, then you have taken that step and the very next step is in the world. Now both of them are there. And this is where Judah, it's all coming back to him. And he's so overcome by it. It could be what David was experiencing where he's going to pronounce judgment on Tamar for the sin he committed. Even if it wasn't with Tamar and he didn't know how this is all going to come out. He's pronouncing judgment on the sin that he committed. He's pronouncing judgment on the, of the sin that he deserves. And I have found, and I'm sure you have as well, that it's so much easier to see sin in other people than in ourselves. It's just a problem we have. Instead of allowing the Lord to speak directly to us. Judah tries to pay her with the goat that he owes and she couldn't be found because she went home, put her widow garments back on. After a few months, she's beginning to show. And I recognize, hey, she's pregnant. And Judah's outraged and demands that she be burned. No balanced judgment in this man. He's out having sex with a harlot and now she, he wants her judged for being a harlot. Just like King David, just where he was. And in every one of us, church, there is this natural reaction of denial and refusal. Denial and refusal. We deny it ever happened and then we refuse to own up to it to take responsibility. So what will God do? He'll send us Nathans. Friends who have enough courage, men and women that are close to us, have enough courage that will tell us the truth when everyone else won't. And if uh, he can't find a man or a woman that will come and tell us the truth, he'll send the Holy Spirit with great conviction. Speak to us. And you can see how it all wraps up. If you're not in the word, you're not in prayer, you're not in fellowship, you're neglecting people that God has sent your way, what happens? You begin to grieve the Holy Spirit. You, become, you, you, you begin to have a conscience that's seared like a hot iron. And then you're just on your own. I've seen it a million times. And I, I know millions exaggerated. I've seen it way too many times. How's that? I've seen it way too many times to people sitting right here in this room or to people worshiping with us Years ago in the school, standing right in front of me, or on a much smaller scale when we had Bible studies midweek, just a couple people there, 20, 30 people there, and I'd be right there. I could see them. I could feel their breath. They're so close because the room was so small. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen like some right now. Right now you're thinking, I'll never happen to me, never happen to me. Take heed lest you fall. Given the right circumstances, And the right timing, you can make the worst of decisions and not take that way of escape. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Pick up with me as we close. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. Kind of plain dumb, you know. And she said, please determine whose these are. The signet the cord and the staff. And Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give to her Shelah, my son, and he never knew her again. Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth that behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was when she was giving birth that one put out the hand and the midwife took a scarlet thread 
and bound it on his hand saying, this one came out first. And it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly. Remind you of anybody? A little bit of a story of Jacob and Esau. How'd you break through? The breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was Perez. And afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called Zerah. When Judah was publicly identified as responsible for Tamar's pregnancy, his response seemed to be genuine repentance. And we'll accept it as such. He confessed his wrong. He repented by ceasing from further sexual relations with Tamar. And it's evidently, as one commentator put it, because of his repentance being genuine that Jacob did not exclude him from receiving a special blessing as he would later exclude Reuben, Simei, uh, Simeon, and Levi. And because Judah humbled himself, God raised him up to be the chief of the house of Israel and blessed the children that he fathered, even though they were a result of his sin. And here in chapter 38, we see that is the children of Israel becoming carbon copies of the Canaanites. It was natural for them to have incestuous relationships. It was natural for them to neglect. It was natural for them to go into harlots and to hire prostitutes for a goat. Uh, and we're seeing that God will take them out of the land. We'll see later on that God will take them to Egypt for a season, to Goshen, where they're going to grow and prosper. But then they're going to become enslaved and treated harshly only to be delivered through a hand, the hand of a man by the name of Moses, led into the promised land once again to gain the victory through Joshua. And who does God send ahead to set this all up? Joseph. And we'll get back to him in the next chapter. This is all happening. You're like, how could, how could the coming of Messiah be so messy? Like, look at this family. Look what they've already done, and we're not even a few chapters into this. Look, look at their lives. But then we have to step back and go, man, isn't our life messy? And isn't there all kinds of undone things? And even if it's not outward, you know, sometimes Christians are really good at living outward lives, but in their, their sin in their minds. Nobody knows, but you know. They sin in their faithlessness. They sin in their secret gossips or murdering people in their hearts. How would we ever know that? That you have such hatred for someone. But the Lord knows. And we give you a big hug at church and man, what we don't know is we're, we're hugging a murderer, man. Someone that has great issues that need to be dealt with through forgiveness. Forgiveness. Look, our lives are messy too, but they don't have to be this bad. You don't have to commit this kind of sin to humble yourself before God. It doesn't have, we can let these be examples to us so that we might live in a life of appreciation of grace. I was talking to one of my kids recently and I was talking to another kid that's not mine and talking about the benefits of good decisions. It's a principle I gave my kids all throughout, our marriage, all throughout raising my kids that there are benefits to good decisions and there are consequences to bad decisions. And it's your life. You're going to crush and break my heart, I'm sure, if you decide to do whatever you want to do and sin. And, but I'm secondary because it's your life. It's your life. And I just want what's best for you. And so I want to teach you how to make good choices because God blesses good choices. And then when you grow up, you will then enjoy the benefits of a life of good choices. Not perfect choices, but good choices, right? Because the testimony I have, God pulled me out of the pit, out of the miry clay after sin wrecked my life. Many of your testimonies, like my kids, is that God prevented them from sin. That he delivered them from sin. He delivered me out of sin, gross sin. Why? Because I made bad choices. My, cho my kids, for the most part, I mean, as far as I know, they've made good choices. Just like you as a church. In a real way, although I'm not old enough to be your dad, the, God, the Bible speaks of a spiritual fatherhood of the pastor. Paul talked about that, remember, to the Corinthians. 
Not a fatherhood like in Roman Catholicism where you call me father, don't do that. That's forbidden. But in a sense of helping you, guide you to your one true father. And so I give you the same advice. Make good choices so that you'll benefit from them. So that you live a life that honors God. You don't have to clean up your mess. You don't have to live with the consequences. Well, but Ed, you know, grace, grace, grace. You just said a million times, grace, grace, grace. Yeah, but that issue has already been answered in the Bible. Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. Absolutely not. That is not the pathway to experience the grace of God. How about this? Experience the grace of God, of his supplying strength and his fortification of your life to avoid sin altogether. And to have less and less of it in your life. So that anyone living with you will see your character and your integrity. You don't have to live the the life of a hypocrite. That God can use you greatly. And before you know it, you'll be with the Lord in heaven anyway. And so carve your name in hearts, not in marble. And the Lord will just bless your, your life. You just enjoy the fruitfulness of living for the Lord. So Father, thank you for the privilege of your word tonight. And, and just knowing that in a difficult chapter, there might be some difficult chapters in the books of our lives too. And we're so grateful we got through it. So grateful you pulled us through. So grateful, God, that you repaired and restored. And we, we, we are in need of that. Help us to abide in you, to live a humble, simple life, trusting you, following you closely, fighting the good fight of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.